Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that makes time and space to think about pedagogy, teaching and learning, professional development, anything of interest to time poor but enthusiasm rich primary teachers. This week, I'm joined by Lisa Grace Wilson. Hi, Lisa. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. It's great to have you here. We're going to focus our attention on how teachers can get involved in writing about their craft, which is something I think is very important and something that really, you know, you give some fantastic advice in Kate Jones's Smashing Glass Ceilings. But you're currently the editorial director at Teach Middle East. Tell us a bit about who you are and how you got here. So my name, oh, he just told my name, right? Um, and I'm the editor of Teach Middle East. But prior to that, in my, I'd say my most glorious days, <laughs> I was a teacher of modern languages. Um, I taught in London. Um, that's where my career started in Enfield. Um, I'm a secondary teacher. And I then moved to Haringey. And, and I taught for several years, too many years that I'm not even willing to mention. But then in 2010, I moved out here to Abu Dhabi with North Anglia Education as a consultant, working with the government on their school reform. And then I went on to lead schools out here um, as principal. And then I transitioned into education journalism in 2018 to become the editorial director of Teach Middle East magazine, which is the largest platform for educators out here in the GCC region. So that's that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, I mean, what what a career. I think yeah, you're underselling it, you know, nutshell is right. What languages did you teach? So I taught Spanish as the main language, and then sometimes they forced me to teach French at gunpoint because I'm really not a French teacher. But, I, you know, as a linguist, you you dabble in several languages, but my main language is Spanish. And I also taught literature and I also taught English as well up to GCE, GCSE. I'm aging myself, GCSE. For me, what was really interesting when I read your your sort of contribution to Smashing Glass Sailings was the fact that you've both been in the classroom but also in this world of sort of um education publishing and i think it'd be really fascinating to see your tech on you know understanding both sides what inspired you to start writing about teaching so i've always loved to write um I'm a bit of an introvert, surprising to many people, because I do have this way of like putting on a, a face when I go out and just be all jolly, but I'm a bit of an introvert and I think deeply about things. So when I was in the classroom, a way for me to process what I was doing was to write. Um, and then my friend actually said to me, why don't you publish that? Why don't you put it on a blog or send it to one of these publications? I think at the time it was like the tears or teach primary or one of those. And, um, and I was like, yeah, I'll do it. But I never kind of did. <laughs> and then eventually, um, I, I sent one to somebody, I think, can't remember whom. Um, and they were like, no, you need to put stuff out there. And that's how I started really just writing about my own experiences and, and, and then took it from there into like things I was researching and things I was reading. And then I started to write about my take on different books that I've been reading. Do you think it was imposter syndrome that was stopping you initially or lack of confidence? Hmm. I just, yeah, maybe a bit of imposter syndrome, maybe a bit of kind of thinking, why would someone want to read my dribble? Because <laughs> um, they were just like my take and my thoughts on things. And I just, I guess somehow in my mind, didn't really connect it to an audience per se. It was just later on that I thought, maybe other people might like this, you know? Yeah, I mean, for me, they're the most interesting blogs to read and articles to read. You know, those that focus on things in the classroom. And uh, yeah, so I, th I think there definitely is an audience for it. I mean, whenever you're looking for pieces, is that the kind of thing you're searching for? So now that I'm on the other side, right, because it's I mean, we're talking about it in a very condensed way, but we're talking about a good 12 years, <laughs> you know. Um, so now that I'm on the other side and I'm looking at other people's writing, what really 
um, attracts me is authentic writing about people's experiences and stories um, and learnings from the classroom. You know, I love to read pieces where people try to do action research in the classroom and then say this is what failed and this is what worked and this is what I'm going to do next time. I love those pieces. I geek out like I'm like, oh, I wonder if they could have tried this or that. And I'm, I go, I go really, I go really deep into thinking about what that teacher might have done differently and what they can do better next time. Um, and I love those pieces. So those are the kinds of pieces I like to read. Nice. Do you ever get anyone who just says this was a total disaster? You know, and they argue yeah. where things went wrong. Love those above all as well, because then you really could start to unpack what went wrong. Because um, it's all good to say, oh, that was a, a resounding success and then carry on. But when you start to unpack lessons from failures, especially failures in the classroom where it happened, maybe in front of uh, a line manager or in front of the students or even an inspector even, then, you know, there's a lot of richness in there and a lot of vulnerability and authenticity um, in that writing. I, I love those pieces. Yeah, I, I think in the world of social media, we don't always get as much as we want. And I think it's the same in academic publishing. You know, you have to publish positive results. So it's almost geared towards this. I mean, when when you were sort of honing your craft, did you just write the way it came to you? Or did you work on how you were presenting your work and how you present your thoughts and things together? Or did it just happen over time? I think it happened over time. I really didn't like consciously think, oh, I'm going to tweet this or tweet that. I really just wrote how I felt what my thoughts were and then I would go back and edit for like fluff like oh that wasn't necessary cut that out I think my editing is more to do with not 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 trying to improve but trying to reduce on fluff so I would go and just cut 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 mercilessly and sometimes like a 1500 word article would become a 1000 word article because I would just go and just mercilessly remove stuff that I thought was an overstatement or was just not necessary or did not bring the reader to the point that I wanted them to be at. So, yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm seeing a lot of myself in that because uh, I think loquacious is the word that some people politely use to describe fluff. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it's definitely, yeah, I think, um, and most articles are like, they're around that 1,800 mark and so that that's almost like if you're getting to the point this is this is the number you're probably going to be hitting i think i don't know would you agree with that yeah i'd say anywhere between 1500 and 2000 words is that if you're going over that then that's a bit superfluous be careful <laughs> you know how can teachers balance their time and energy between teaching and writing because i mean hopefully i've interpreted your career in the right way there was a there was a bridge between your past sort of past roles and your current role where you were also writing at the same time so i mean how how did you balance it and what would your advice be for teachers who want to do both at the same time um i would say don't think of them as two separate things i think try to find that harmony between both because as a teacher you have to be reflective and for me, being a writer is my way of reflecting. And so as I teach, I reflect. And my way of reflecting is writing. So all I do is just turn that reflection into an article. And it's the same way for others. If you are in the classroom, you're trying things, you're doing different things, instead of thinking, oh, now I'm finished teaching, now I've become a writer. No, no, no. You're a teacher who writes. And so once you are done implementing and, and working in the classroom and you sit down to reflect, put that reflection in the form of, a, of an article, and then that can then be edited and published. So it's all flowing seamlessly and it doesn't feel like extra work. I love that. That makes so, so much sense. I mean, the bits, the, the pieces that I'm most proud of are the ones that have had a direct relevance to what I've been doing or what I've been thinking about. Um, and I think, yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, how did you use your, did, was it in the evening time? Was it actually part of the school day that you would use? Or did you find a set time that you would work, th work to? 
Yeah, so I, I couldn't work in the evening times. Like, have you ever worked in Haringey? You work till you're sick. <laughs> so I would work on a Sunday. I would write. I would plan lessons. Um, I know it's not work-life balancey and healthy, and you know, but that's the time I planned. Um, so on a Sunday afternoon, when I'm preparing for the week, I would kind of sit and look back at my previous week. I'm planning lessons for the week coming up. And then I would pen an article. Writing became easier for me over the years. So every Sunday I would put something together. It doesn't mean I would publish something every week. No, sometimes I would be writing the same article for a month because, you know, I'd be adding bits to it. I'd be like, oh, you know, this worked and that worked. We talked about like how you, how you develop the idea and sometimes you would go and disprove your own ideas. So it was really just one day a week that I sat to write. How did you manage to keep your focus over, like say you're writing something over a month. Was it difficult to avoid thinking, oh, I want to write about this instead, or I want to write about that? And how, how did you maintain your focus on that one thing for an extended period of, of time? Yeah, that's a good, I, that's a good question. Um, I, I would go back to it every week and I have to be very honest, sometimes I would completely change the thing. So when I say I'm writing the same article for a month, sometimes that article morphed into a whole different article by week two. And by week three, I added a whole complete other section to it or answered some other questions that I had chatted with my colleagues about and things of that nature. So if I'm honest, I didn't maintain focus all the time on the very same topic but I just kept writing and adding and then editing until it all sort of like made sense. Nice. It's almost like a get it down and then get it right kind of situation. Yeah. Yeah. It's much easier to work with something than it is a blank page. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that sounds fantastic. It's fantastic advice. You're almost essentially saying, you know, find the time that works for you, for you that was one day a week and then just sort of build it up. Cause I think, yeah, with, with the ability to write and publish material so you know the, the barrier to entry is so low it can't feel like there's a pressure to do it more regularly but i think when people think about things that's when they're sort of really well received a teacher asks you for advice because they want to start writing about teaching what, what do you say to them i'd say think about who you're writing it for number one who is it for? It could just be for you and that's okay as well, but who who would this help? Who would it resonate with? Who is it for? And that's number one. And number two would be, why would they pay attention? Because these are just some little preliminary questions that you would ask in your head. And then ask yourself, what am I, what am I interested in? What am I passionate about? What can I talk about or write about at ease? It shouldn't feel like force. It shouldn't feel like, oh my God, I've got to go research this topic or I've got to do. No, what's easy for you? Because when it comes with a level of ease, then it won't feel so pressured or you won't feel compelled to put in extra hours that you probably don't have into writing it. So for a teacher who wants to start, I say start where you're happy and comfortable. Start with the thing that you can talk the most about. And before you start writing, think, who is it for and why should they care? And then that should guide how you write it. What are, what are some of the reasons why people should care? You know, because there's obviously a lot of content out there. What, um, is there anything that you think, oh, yeah, this this really stands out to teachers or this is something that would really interest them? Is there a way to, to measure that? Um, you know, obviously, it's not going to be scientific, but you can get a, a feel for, oh, yeah, this is this is a purpose. You know, I think one of the best things you can do to gauge whether or not something, let's say you you would say it's for teachers of English. Yeah. Go down to your teacher friends who teach English in the English department, or if you're in primary school, talk to your colleagues down the corridor and go, I'm thinking about writing about this. Do you think it's something? And if, gauge the responses. If they, if it's meh from one, two, three, the majority, maybe it's not a thing. Think again. But if you speak to five people and three out of the five people tell you, 
yeah that would be interesting i'd love to read it ask them what would you want to read in an article about x because then that would give you even more ideas on what to write about you know anecdotal research like that is invaluable because you're not writing blindly so I used to ask my friends all the time. I used to be like, I'm writing this article about behavior management. Like what is, what is a big deal for you right now? And they might say, oh, I'm really keen on finding out how to ensure that the students are not bored versus disruptive because there is a huge thing there where sometimes I don't know, is this kid bored or is he just disruptive? Um, and then we go and I, I'll go and think, yeah, I'll dig into the research to find four ways of identifying if the child is bored or if the child is disruptive purposefully. And then that would send me down a nice little rabbit hole. But I know that there are people who would want to read that because I've spoken to. So here's the other thing. You're not going to know if 100,000 people want to read it. You just never will guess. But my, my thing is, if three people want to read it, chances are 30 people might want to read it. So it's worth doing. I think that's genius because teachers love having those kind of conversations anyway. I mean, we can't go to the, to, um, you know, social events without starting to talk about education at some point. Oh. So <laughs> draw, drawing on that desire is, uh, is fantastic. You know, and yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about my own practice and yeah, definitely have like informal focus groups where we talk about education and then decide, oh, something needs to be written about this. I think that's really, really valuable. I mean, you mentioned finding your audience. And I think writing for yourself is very important. But do you find that your authors will write to others who are in their position, like say the maths lead will write for a maths lead audience or school leaders will write for, you know, senior leader audience, you know, is, is it that the typical way to go in terms of identifying who you're writing to because you know that group so intimately? Or do you find that there's a, a greater spread? There's a mix, but I think a lot of the times it's what you've just described is that you will write to the audience that you're most familiar with, or you might even write to the audience that you, you know, you were familiar with. So, for example, I used to be a middle leader and I can write more sort of advice type articles for up and coming middle leaders because I have been there and I know what that road feels like. So I can then write an article talking about things that they should look out for and giving advice. So there are two ways to, to look at that. And I typically get articles in either of those categories. It would take some bravery to um, just reach out of your, your group, I think, you know, because, you know, like you say, if you're, if you're thinking about something all the time, if you're, if you're living it, then you've got those hooks and those reference points to um to go to. I mean, predominantly, are your readers teachers or school leaders? So they are predominantly teachers. We write, we have articles spread across from from teachers right the way up to even school owners. However, the majority of our readers are teachers. Um, just by the sheer numbers, you have more teachers than you do leaders. So, yeah. Nice. I mean, it's good that they're finding the time to read about education. It's one of my things I think reading is extremely important. And so if they think about audience, they think about the, whether or not people will find it interesting. And then from there, say they get to the point where they're able to write a piece for, for a publication. They also have, they'll have to balance their voice with the sort of house style. Do you have any advice for how teachers can balance those two things? Uh, it depends on the publication because for us at Teach, we tend to ask our, our writers to make it friendly, simple language that's geared primarily towards the educators. And then we, we have copy editors who might tweak certain things in the article, but we tend not to mess with the teacher's voice so much because you want it to come, you want it to come from them in its as, as, as authentically as you could. However, if you're writing for more formal, you know, like maybe 
the the guardian or i don't know you know times the times or something that's a little bit different but if you're writing for a teacher focused publication chances are your style will fit when you're sort of reading proposals and things like that there sort of functional english acceptable for publications or are you looking for almost a sort of skill with the English language. I don't know. Is there is there a continuum on which your your sort of articles fall and things together? I'm trying to think about teachers who are thinking, oh yeah, I can I can write in English, but I don't have the, you know, the the sort of the gift of prose. Um what are you what's your take on sort of the the both the functionality and the expressiveness of people's use of English is what I'm trying to say. If you have a good grasp of the English language and you are able to speak in very clear terms, then you should be able to write well. The problem comes when you start to use jargons and colloquialisms that might not be understood by a wider audience or might be misconstrued even. Um, And so for people who are worried about their grasp of English, I would say that's less of a worry now because you could run it through AI (laughs) and get some help with that. But um, as long as your English is at the level where it is clear and you can communicate clearly, then I think you should be able to pen an article. Because here's the thing, I think previously, and 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 I've seen the shift as well. Previously, articles used to be extremely formal with very sometimes superfluous words that communicated maybe above a grade 10 or 11 reading level. Nowadays, the the, the consensus is that you write to a grade eight, grade nine level, and you make the content as clear as possible so that anyone, a second language um, learner, Um, someone who has a PhD, everyone can access it. Because nowadays the focus is a lot more on communication over style. Style is important. And as you become a more seasoned writer, you will develop your style. But I think initially when you're starting out, shoot for clear communication. That's brilliant. I think, um, I think I read somewhere that the average broadsheet, a 14 year old can read all the words that are used in it. So if they're the most advanced sort of newspapers that we, that then that we have, because I think it drops to closer to eight years old for the, for the tabloids. And so I don't know how that translates in that's pre GCSE grades, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, So that's a good point. I mean, it was a very clumsy way of asking, you know, because I know people will be thinking, Oh, I'm just not a gifted writer, but I think, you know, it, it's it's pushing on beyond that, isn't it? And having the confidence to say, actually, I've got something to say. Functional use of English is is more than sufficient for this kind of task. Yes, I think a lot of people think as well that they have to really become Shakespearean <laughs> in their abilities. But the truth is that if you are able to tell a good story and write a good story, in simple English, you're you're more than capable. You mentioned AI. Has AI had? Can you see AI generated articles coming through, or are we still a bit early for that? Oh, I haven't seen many. I've seen a few. Um, people need to be careful with AI because AI will will have you sounding silly. <laughs> So I feel like if you're going to use AI, 100% do not use it to write an entire article. And I think you can put an article that you've written into AI and ask it to identify areas for improvement. And then you can make those improvement yourselves. Or you can put the article in AI and ask it to identify grammatical errors according to the British standard of English or the Americans, whichever standard you're using, 
These are things that AI can do for you so that you don't submit an article with grammatical errors or with spelling errors or things like that, that would detract from it. But having it write an article for you, that's risky. I wouldn't do that. Yeah, very risky. I mean, the whole thing's based on patterns, those large, those large language learning models. And so you can see the same patterns being, you know, they, they like to do like the, the, this conclusion thing when they sum up everything that's been in the thing. And it doesn't feel mm -hmm. like the way a human would uh, would summarize things. No. And I feel like also if AI writes it for you, then it doesn't carry that human touch that makes people want to read more. There is something about you saying things the way you would that makes people want to hear what else you have to say. And AI just cannot do that. No, absolutely. Yeah, and I think I think you're right. It's, uh, you know, there are definitely ways, you know, for instance, everyone's got blind spots in their grammatical awareness. And so if you throw a, a paragraph or a sentence through and say, you know, is this grammatically accurate? Although Word does have its own editor, doesn't it? Have you ever used that? No, I use Grammarly. No endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Is it good? I mean, I've, I've, not, I've seen the adverts, but I've never used it. Yeah, I find it to be quite good. I have to be honest, it's not 100%, but in terms of catching, because I type very, very fast and I have a lot of writing to do. So in terms of catching my spellings or catching in, where I've missed an article or put the wrong article somewhere, it's brilliant for that. And that's what I use it for. How do teachers get a foot on the ladder? You know, should they wait to be approached by a publication or can they be proactive? Are there ways they can sort of get their voice out there? I think if you wait, you ever seen those meme where you're waiting and then you see a skeleton? <laughs> I think that's what will happen if you wait for a publication to approach you. You'll be like that skeleton with the newspaper in front of you waiting. No, you definitely pitch. You find the editors of the, the publication that you like, whether you find them on LinkedIn, that's the best place because they're all there. Um, or you look at their website and see where you're allowed to pitch and pitch, pitch article ideas. Editors love drafts don't just pitch ideas send a draft because if you pitch an idea and they can't actually read through and to to evaluate whether or not this is something that they could work with they're going to probably bin the pitch so when you pitch send a draft of whatever they are it doesn't have to be the nicely finished product no but if you send a draft they can then send you back pointers to make it um, publication worthy and I would say if you don't hear from a publisher or a editor one time, don't be like, oh, they don't like my stuff. Mm -mm. They are busy, busy, busy people. Send it at least three, four times before you give up on, you know, sending it. I would say send it even five times, but, but space it out um, because that's how much, that's how many emails people get. And so yours just need to be right there at the right time to get picked up. And once you are picked up, you know, there's just so many possibilities because then you'll be known for a particular thing. How I met Kate, she pitched for a article on retrieval practice and she just kept pitching <laughs> and she's brilliant. Like I've, I've, I met like she just kept like suggesting, oh, Lisa, I cannot write on this or I can write on that. You know what I mean? And so eventually I associate her very closely with retrieval practice because one, she's brilliant and two, she was really consistent. And many of the writers that write for us, that's how they get on and they go on to write books, not because of us, obviously, but because of themselves. They go on to do books, speaking all different types of opportunities, but they just didn't give up at just one pitch. That kid example almost typifies everything you've said today, you know, writing about what you know well, you know, being persistent and having the confidence and things out there. And, you know, because, yeah, kid is synonymous with retrieval practice because of how, like you say, consistent and sort of the value she's added to teachers' lives. Because, you know, every time I talk to teachers, and they talk to me about retrieval practice and think, well, have you read Kate's second book or have you read her third book, you know, and, and things like that there. So 
it makes makes total sense. I mean, in a world where we're getting countless emails, do you think emails or like if you're using LinkedIn direct messages, which one's more likely to get a response from someone? I have to be honest, I'd say do both because then that familiarity, oh, that's the person who mm, do both. I mean, I've just recently joined LinkedIn and I'm still getting my head around how it works, you know, but it took really? me like, yeah, it took me like five years to get to, to get to grips with uh, Twitter whenever it first came out. Yeah. LinkedIn uh, is phenomenal. My, I would encourage everyone to be on LinkedIn. You know, it's it, people used to be like, oh, it's corny or people just pretend on LinkedIn. But for it, but if your intention is to be a writer or a thought leader in the space, you need to be on LinkedIn. Twitter used to be like that. And I and I loved Twitter back then. But today's Twitter, no thank you. I'm good. Yeah, it's that little, it's that meme of the little dog sitting with his cup of tea <laughs> surrounded by flames at the minute, isn't it? No, tw- Twitter or X has an X for me right now. It's really I don't like it. It's almost broadcast only mode, you know, whereas you used to have really rich conversations. Yes. Those are just dwindling off and it's becoming a really reduced down, I think. If in that process you're applying, you're sort of pitching your ideas, how much would you publish on your own in a blog? You know, because obviously you don't want to give away a potential article before it's been, before it's had the chance to get published. Would you, I don't know, how would you balance publishing your own work and getting published by a magazine or a periodical? I think what I would do is on my own blog, I would do a certain type of more personal stories, articles about, you know, my day to day. People love those types of things. Funnily enough, they love to know, um, to know the little nitty gritties you know, what color pens you're choosing, what, why, and this just really, I, I would get, hone my craft by publishing my own day-to-day stories on a blog. And for the periodicals and magazines, I would pitch ideas that are more thought leadership focused or research backed or, you know, or that goes a little bit more in depth in my practice and its relevance to others. So it's almost like a complementary system where mm-hmm. both feeding each other, but they're not stamping on each other on the space they're trying to um, occupy, I think. Yeah, Yeah, because I think in, when you blog, people follow your blog to learn you and to learn about what you're doing. And when people read articles in magazines, they do that so that they can learn to implement something themselves. How many, how many pieces do you think you read in a week? Ooh. You know, loads coming in. Ooh, um, easily 30 pieces a week. Um, I, I can read six, six good articles a day. Is, and so over a five day week, I'm reading like 30 pieces. Would that be the bulk of what your, your role is? So I suppose it wouldn't be, what it that's just supplementary to what the, the duties you're carrying out, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's it's more to do with shaping the direction. So, you know, like meeting with my deputy and like thinking about what's out there and a lot of reading around other people's publications as well. Editors don't tell you this, but we all read each other's stuff. It's just how it happens Um, because you have to know what's topical. You have to keep your finger on the pulse. And you have to you have to then start to be able to go ahead of the curve to say, oh, I think this is going to be a big deal. We might need to find um, some content around that. Um, and then I also host the Teach Middle East podcast. And on that, we get to talk to a lot of people about different things, but also we do a little section on there called Behind the Principal's Desk, where we get to just talk to the principals about who they are and what makes them tick and what do they like and and that type of thing. So it's like a it's like a split. And many magazines, many education publications also carry a catalog of events. So whether it's the TES or PI or SECED or Teach, they all carry a catalog of events that complement the publication. And so do we. So we also have 
events like next week we have the Middle East School Leadership Conference coming up and my role in that is to curate the program, the agenda with my team. So that takes a lot of work, but it's it's complementary, right? Because what people are writing about and reading about is also what they want to hear about when they go out to conferences and things like that. So my job is to really like keep my finger on the pulse and think, okay, is this relevant? Should we be finding speakers for this or writers for that? I see. I mean, I was going to say, I was going to segue into, yeah, as if you weren't busy enough, you're also organizing this conference. I mean, who have you got speaking at the conference? I think I've seen some of the, um, some of the speakers, but not many of them. Were there anybody I would know? Or are you taught as a predominantly? Yeah, from the, from the UK, we have Hannah Wilson, the director of Diverse Ed, and she's coming out. Um, we also have Dr. Helen Wright who is from LSC Consulting. She is a leadership coach, very well known in the international space and I think also in the UK. Um, and then we have people from the US. We have Akbar Rahil from, from Prep Expert, which is um, one of those, a Mark Cuban company, really, um, really well known company in the US. And then from here we have Mark Leppard, MBE, he is the principal headmaster of the British school Al Khubairat out here. Um, coming over from Kuwait, we have Dr. Claire Shea and Savag Kendirjan, and they are going to be talking all about AI. And um, from here, we also have keynoting from the UK, Hayley Malumba, one of the youngest, I think, mayors out of um, East London. She was the youth mayor, something like that, and really powerful speaker. And then we also, from the from here, but from the UK as well, Dr. Neil Hopkin, very dynamic speaker, talking about what we need to be looking at, at leaders in this age of AI and automation, etc. Almost like a wake up call his talk will be. Um, and then we have several principals and headmasters, headmistresses from across the region who will be on panels and also running workshops. So it's two days of great learning. Yeah, it sounds really, really exciting. And I think, yeah, I know, I know how, how hard you're working on it and having seen sort of the, you, you reflect, you've been sharing your reflections on, uh, on LinkedIn recently. I'm thinking, wow, you know, one a one day conference would be enough. <laughs> never mind, never mind too. So, hats off. It's and the fifth. Hats. It's the fifth um, Middle East School Leadership Conference, and every year it it morphs into something else. And and we go, but the work is worth it, I think, because those two days are great fun. I, I enjoy them. It, it's been a pleasure to speak to you today. I think you've provided really clear and actionable advice. For anyone who is interested in writing about their craft, but perhaps didn't feel they they could, if that makes sense. And so I think that'll be hopefully really useful for listeners. All that's left to do is say thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And to everyone at home, until next time, thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.